Church Evangelism Lecture 9 We have been following God's unchanging evangelistic ministry from eternity past to this present day. In our last study, we learned that after the Proto-Evangelium in the Garden of Eden, the Bible basically follows the godly line of men. That is, those who believed God and trusted in His promise of the woman's conquering seed until the promised seed finally came. One of the key men within this godly line of men was a man named Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read where the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We saw that this gospel revelation to Abraham was a threefold promise concerning the future work of the promised seed. First, a great land, the ground reclaimed. Second, a great nation, the seed redeemed. And third, a great blessing, the curse removed. Now, as the Bible continues to follow the godly line, Jehovah continues to evangelize the godly line and prepare them for the coming of their promised seed. Part of that preparation included fulfilling the immediate promise to Abraham of making him a great nation by giving him physical offspring. As we learned before, the immediate fulfillment of the promise to make Abraham a great nation was a token of a greater future and spiritual nation that would come through Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ, the promised Savior. Though this spiritual blessing of Abraham was available for all nations, most of the people who believed in Christ during this time were also physical descendants of Abraham, who became the nation of Israel. And it is the people of this nation God continued to reveal his gospel to. Let's talk about these special people. The Bible tells us that Abraham had Isaac, and then Isaac had a son named Jacob. As God changed Abram's name to Abraham, so God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jacob, or Israel, then had twelve sons, and these twelve sons made up the twelve tribes of Israel, which comprised the immediate physical nation that descended from Abraham. As God gave the gospel promises to Abraham, so God also passed down those same promises to Isaac. Then, when Isaac's son Jacob, or Israel, was grown, God passed those same promises down to him, and ultimately to the nation that descended from Israel, which we now know as the nation of Israel. Now let's take God's precious word and turn to Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, and begin our study of the gospel given to Israel. In Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 14, the Bible says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba, and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took one of the stones of the place, and put it under his head, and laid down in that place to sleep. 
and he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Immediately we recognize the familiar promise God is giving to Jacob here. For God is basically using the same language toward Jacob that he did with Jacob's predecessors, Abraham and Isaac. What is not so familiar to us, however, is this strange new dream that accompanies the ancient promise, in which Jacob saw a ladder. Okay, I would like for you to go back with me now to verse 12, and let's take a closer look at what Jacob saw. Underscore these words, a ladder set up on the earth. Now underscore the top of it reached to heaven. Notice that this was not a ladder set up in heaven and extending down to the earth. This was a ladder set up on earth and reaching up to heaven. In Romans chapter 3 verse 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this ladder was not coming short of God's glory. No, quite the contrary. In fact, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, between heaven and earth. Underscore, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Do you remember when we learned that the word angel means messenger? Go to verse 13 now and underscore the words, The Lord stood above it and said. Circle the word said. Please turn in your Bibles now to Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Underscore, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. We see then in this text that iniquity, or sin, puts a division between us and God. Do you remember what happened to Adam after he sinned? Genesis 3.23 tells us, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden. And then, in verse 24, the Bible says, So he drove out the man. So, once again, we see how sin, or iniquity, creates a division between us and God. This is why Jesus will say on Judgment Day to the lost, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Luke thirteen twenty seven. In Luke sixteen 
25 through 26, Jesus tells us the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Listen to the response Abraham gave when the rich man in hell asked Abraham to send Lazarus to him to help cool his tongue. The Bible says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, listen now, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So we see, once again, how sin creates a great division between us and God. But as God passes down the promise of the eternal gospel to Jacob, in his dream, Jacob sees a ladder set up on earth that does not come short of heaven, but spans the full length between God and man, reaching up to heaven. Isaiah the prophet said, Your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. But in the dream, the Lord stood above the ladder, and from the ladder he spoke to Jacob. And the angels, the messengers of God, went both up and down the ladder between heaven and earth. You see then how God was showing Jacob that this ladder would be the means by which God would bridge the gap sin had created and restore the relationship sin had destroyed. Now turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 47, please, and let's read an interesting discourse between the Lord Jesus and Nathanael. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, Verse 47, we read, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. When Jesus said Nathanael was an Israelite indeed, he was saying that Nathanael was a true Israelite, that is, a child of of the godly line of men, someone who was looking for and trusting in the promised Savior to come. Now look in verse 48. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael was probably by himself under that fig tree, and Jesus was physically nowhere around him. But Jesus let Nathanael know that he, being God, still knew and saw Nathanael well before Nathanael ever saw him. Because of this, Nathanael recognized that Jesus was the seed of the woman the long-promised Savior to come. So look in verse 49. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Nathanael is saying to Jesus, You are the Savior the prophets wrote about. Now keep this in mind and listen closely to how Jesus responds to what Nathanael just said. Look in verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter 
ye shall see heaven opened, and, watch this now, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In Genesis 28.12 we read, And he dreamed, and behold a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Brethren, don't you see? Jacob's ladder is none other than the eternal seed of the woman, that Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, set up on earth through his birth in a manger, bridging the gap through his death on a cross, and reaching into heaven through his resurrection from a grave and ascension to the right hand of God. After God gave the gospel to Israel the man, in the vision of Jacob's ladder, he continually gave the gospel to Israel the nation by his prophets. And as that nation grew, the nation Israel thus became the caretaker of the great promise of the woman's conquering seed, who would one day come to bruise the serpent's head beneath his feet. Okay, we have seen God giving the gospel to Israel the man, so now I would like to give you an example of God giving the gospel to Israel the nation. I suppose there is no clear revelation of the gospel given to Israel the nation than that which was given through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53. Please turn now to Isaiah chapter 53. Now before we read Isaiah's gospel message, I want to read to you again the Proto-Evangelium, and then I want you to see how beautifully the scriptures flow together. In Genesis 3.15, God said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Once again, the woman's seed would bruise the head of the serpent by placing him under his feet. But in so doing, the heel of the conquering seed would itself be bruised, which speaks of his death on the cross, though not yet fully revealed in the text we just read. But look now at the incredible detail given to Isaiah, and watch how well the scriptures come together. In Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In verse 5, underscore, bruised for our iniquities. In this text, we can now clearly see that the bruising of the woman's seed is for our iniquities. Those great enemies that separate us from God. We see that Isaiah said the Lord would lay on this promised seed the iniquity of us all and that he would be bruised by bearing the punishment or chastisement of our sin on our behalf. 
Look in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We see in this verse that it will please Jehovah to bruise the promised seed. Why would it please God to bruise the Lord Jesus? Why would he be pleased to bruise the promised seed? Well, do you remember how God promised Abraham that he would multiply his seed? And how Jesus said, except a corn or seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. In verse 10, underscore, When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Okay, now underscore, The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper. Circle the word pleasure. Circle the word prosper. Jehovah is pleased to bruise his son for our sins because in bruising Jesus for our sins, he is bruising the serpent's head beneath our feet and fulfilling the eternal gospel given to Christ. By making Christ's soul an offering for the sin of the people, Isaiah said God would see the seed he promised to Abraham. As the pleasure of the Lord was to bruise the promised seed, through the bruising of that promised seed, the seed would be multiplied and God's purpose would prosper. Isn't that marvelous? Because man has committed iniquities, Jesus will one day say to many, Depart from me. But because Jesus was bruised for those iniquities, he now says to all, Come unto me. Now that the gospel is given to Israel as a nation, the nation Israel was charged with keeping God's precepts and God's prophecies concerning the coming Savior. Israel was to be teaching them to their families, from the fathers to the sons, and teaching them to the nation, from the priests to the people, until the time would finally come when the Savior would be born to fulfill the promise of the eternal gospel by placing our enemies under his feet. Although God would be faithful to keep his promise to deliver us from our enemies, sin, Satan, and death, the nation Israel, on the other hand, was not faithful to keep their charge to preserve the truths of this gospel message. Many of the priests who were supposed to teach the people and preserve the true meanings of the sacrifices fell away from the truth and perverted the gospel, just as many ministers of the gospel continue to do today. For this and other reasons, the nation of Israel experienced a great moral decline, and the clear truth of the gospel became very obscure. Speaking of this very thing, God said to Israel in Isaiah 3, verse 12, O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Did you hear that? God said Israel's spiritual leaders were destroying the way of their paths. The word way here is speaking about a highway 
for the people to travel on in their walk with God. For example, when we drive, we yield to someone the right of way. Since the current spiritual leaders were destroying the way, Isaiah told the people that God would send someone special to prepare the way of truth in preparation for the promised Savior to come. Isaiah spoke of this special person in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 through 5, when he said, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The last prophet to speak to Israel before the promised Savior would be born was the prophet Malachi. You can think of Malachi as God's last word to Israel before Jesus came. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 2 and let's see the condition of Israel and its leadership before Christ came. And listen to what God told them. Malachi chapter 2. Let's read verse 7 and 8. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. So, because Israel's spiritual leaders had destroyed the way of God and departed from that path, God promised again through Malachi that he would send that special person before Christ came to prepare the way for his people so they would be spiritually ready to receive the Lord Jesus when he finally came. Look with me in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, let's read the last of the Old Testament, the very final words God said to Israel before Christ came. Look in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, now understand that in the New Testament, the name Elijah is referred to as Elias. These were God's final words to Israel in the Old Testament leaving the nation of Israel waiting for that special messenger and the promised Savior to come. And about 400 years later, that special messenger finally arrived to prepare the way before Christ by giving the people a right view toward the sin they had committed and toward the Savior God had promised. This special messenger would be the evangelist, John the Baptist, who would come in the spirit and power of Elias, as we just read. Please turn to Luke chapter 1, and let's look at what the angel Gabriel told John the Baptist's father in Luke 1, verse 15. In Luke 1, 15 through 17, we read, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. 
and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Okay, look here now. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay, keep your Bible open in Luke chapter 1, and watch the seamless continuity of God's work of evangelism. As I read to you now, a brief montage of scriptures that span from the gospel given to Christ in eternity past to Christ given to the world in Luke chapter 1, where we will read the evangelistic blessing spoken by John the Baptist's father. The Gospel Given to Christ Psalm 110.1 A Psalm of David The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. To Adam, Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. To Abraham, Genesis 22, 16-17, And said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And now to Israel, Luke 1, 68-75. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. Isn't that wonderful? Do you see how the gospel just flows from one end of the Bible to the other? In verse 71, underscore that we should be saved from our enemies. Okay, circle the word saved and circle the word enemies. In eternity past, Jehovah said, I will put your enemies under your feet. In the garden, Jehovah said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And thus, in Luke chapter 1, Christ came to save us from our enemies. And so there will be no mistake as to what enemies Christ came to save us from.